My next guest is Andrea Bittner. Andrea is an educator, author, and speaker. She lives on the East Coast among some of the fastest speaking people in the country. She has worked with students in grades K through 12 through her 22 years in public education from all over the world. Her work as an English language teacher, reading specialist, literacy coach, and presenter, and high school English teacher inspired her to continue to share the great news. Leaning, learning a second language is an asset, not a handicap. Her first book, Take Me Home, was published by Austin uh, Macaulay in July of 2021. Take Me Home is a story of 11 of her former EL students who gave a firsthand account of what it's really like to become bilingual in America. She is a co-author of Chip Baker's The Impact of Influence, Volume 3, and another co-author in The 100 Nonsensical Things All School Leaders Should Stop Doing. She travels the country speaking and teaching educators to establish relationships and effectively communicate with Yale families. Welcome to the podcast, Andrea. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Well, it's really interesting to talk to somebody who has um, worked a lot with EL families. Um, I have not really had an EL teacher on the podcast before, and I know, you know, there's a lot of uh, listeners who uh, work with families that, um, you know, come from different countries and might be newcomers. So we'll talk a little bit about that uh, during the podcast, but I wanted to start off with uh, asking the question. I start off with everybody. Tell me about a time when you were in the trenches and managed to crawl out. Absolutely. So um, in 22 years, I think we've had many experiences where we feel like we are crawling out of a trench, right? Day in and day out or month in and month out sometimes. But one experience in particular that I think people could connect to is about 10 years ago, I was working with a group of English language learners at the high school level. And I've taught English language learners for 15 of my 22 years in every grade level. And about 10 years ago, I was teaching about 40 different kids and Mm -hmm. about 25 different languages. And we had this real sense of community. Um, We had this huge banner in our classroom that said, what's your plan? And Mm -hmm. I worked with kids from all different walks of life. I had kids who were born here and bilingual. I had kids who were adopted. I had exchange students. I had kids that crossed the border. I had kids that had waited 10 years for a visa and came before mom and dad, or waited Mm -hmm. 10 years and came later. So we had students from almost every continent about 25 different languages and about 40 different kids. And so we had this community called What's Your Plan? And it was this banner in the classroom where every year our seniors would have the alumni return and they would be there to congratulate them on completing this chapter of their plan of their free education and learning English and learning everything that goes with it. And they would present the kids with a t-shirt and that t-shirt would say where they were headed next, whether it was entrepreneur, military, Um, college, training, workforce, university, whatever it was, the alumni were there to kind of welcome them to the real world, tell them what great things are waiting for them. And as they got ready to crawl out of that trench into the next one. And so I worked with this one particular family at the time called the Lopez family. And I would work with all seven of their children. They were all happened to be from the country of Salvador. From Mm -hmm. Sergio all the way down all the blind uh, of the boys to Nancy. And Nancy was the only female in the family. Mm-hmm. And so they all completed this, what's your plan mentality of, you know, I'm, I'm here, I I'm, have this opportunity. It's not an option to go back to my country. It's not an option to be in survival mode. I've got to work through what I need to go through here in order to become successful. And yeah. so Nancy completed that plan and this community that we had. And about a year after I taught her, the last member of the Lopez family, I was teaching one day and there were a bunch of helicopters outside and I thought, wow, like, I hope everything's okay. There's a lot of helicopters outside today. I don't really know what's going on. And my district happens to be surrounded by a lot of train tracks. And so an hour after I was teaching, my principal came down to get me to let me know that one of my students had been hit by the train. Mm. And that student was Nancy. And unfortunately, she made a choice when we saw the video later to wear headphones. And she was walking Mm. along the inside track of the train and she was clipped from behind by the Acela. And so that threw this sense of community and these kids that I'd worked with into a very huge trauma. And so the weeks that followed that were spent navigating a lot of things because mom and dad were still learning English themselves. And dad's Mm. a pastor in the city and mom works alongside of him. And one of the most challenging parts of that day, in addition to her passing, 
was that there was no one locally around who spoke Spanish on the force or within the immediate community to access mom and dad. Mm -hmm. So they were informed and figured out that one of their children had been hurt, but they couldn't exactly piece together what had happened. So they went up to the tracks and they stood there for hours waiting, oh, no. calling yeah. all of their wow. kids to try to figure out what was going on until I was notified and we could all get up there. So that, that was a, a, a huge out of the trench moment for us. And we spent, you know, weeks after navigating this whole system, you know, helping mom and dad deal with their daughter's death, helping them plan a funeral, helping them navigate immigration, helping them navigate the visa process to see if her brother could come and bury his sister, helping all these kids, these 40 students and myself kind of travel through you know, what had just happened and, and navigate yeah. that. So from that experience, um, we, one of my jobs at her funeral was to speak. And so I wrote this short poem at the time and we called it, Take Me Home. And it was an homage to Nancy's life and her crossing into the US. And I kind of went through that process and spoke at her funeral and moved on teaching with the kids and threw that piece of paper on my desk at school. And a few months later, I kind of saw it sitting there and I thought, well, maybe somebody could be helped by this story. You know, we are crawling out of this experience. It's been a really difficult time for all of us. Maybe we, someone could be benefited by hearing about her life experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I put that poem out to a bunch of publishers just in a whim. And about six months later, a publisher got back to me and they said, hey, Andrea, we really liked your poem, but we don't want you to write a poem. We want you to write a book. Yeah. And we're going to give you about six months to do it. And if you come back with something you like, we're going to take you on and publish it. So I started to think, well, I don't just want to tell her story. I want to tell all their stories because they're so different. And so many of them have crawled out of that trench in many different ways. And so I went back and I interviewed 11 of my former bilingual kids who are now in their late 20s, early 30s. And we had conversations about what it was really like for them to become bilingual here in the U.S and how they overcame those triumphs and tribulations and tragedies and challenges and what they gauged from it. And so from those conversations, we were able to create a true story, Take Me Home. And from every conversation we had, it would help, help me listen to them and see something they said that would make me go, and that's your chapter. And that's mm -hmm. your chapter. And so we covered almost every continent and we covered almost every experience. And we created Take Me Home the true story of 11 of my former bilingual kids who give a firsthand account, it's written through their eyes of what it's like to become bilingual in the US and we weave Nancy's story through it. And so that was an experience um, that we created um, coming out of the trenches for people to connect to. Wow, wow. And that was just started as a poem and then turned into a book because that's what the publisher saw from that poem. And We'll talk yeah. a little bit about that. I wanted to highlight some of your um, other writing that's kind of sure. smaller than the book first, and then we'll talk a little bit more about um, what uh, people can expect with Take Me Home. Um, sure. So I wrote, uh, so Rick Jetter, he has um, published a hundred no nonsense things, no nonsense things all teachers should stop doing, uh, which I was a co-author on last year. Oh, and so wow. the hundred no, no nonsense things that all leaders should stop doing uh, will be published in July when this episode comes out. Um, it will already be published. So tell me about the chapter that you write in that book. Absolutely. So I'm honored to be asked to contribute with all these amazing educators across the country in this um, volume two. And so my chapter dealt with um, EL specifically. Okay. And, it, and it talked about the importance of a team in working mm -hmm. together to help ELs navigate all of the different avenues they have to take to become successful here in the U.S. Okay, okay. So you're speaking to leaders in that chapter. So uh, is it a lot about kind of, um, because maybe as a teacher, you've seen uh, some leaders aren't um, really understanding kind of what it is uh, for ELs um, when they're new to the country and getting that support um, as a teacher uh, when you have a lot of families that you're helping navigate through um, just being newcomers and situations like you mentioned a little bit with Andreas, uh, with, uh, with the family that you had. 
Is that kind yes. of a little, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I find that, you know, in the 15 years I've worked with elves and teachers and administrators and support teachers and assistant teachers and office teams and custodians and cafeteria workers and bus drivers, you know, what I found really to be essential, and I talk about this in my chapter um, for Dr. Jetter, is we need all hands on deck. Nobody yes. sees no one. No one, as John, I'm a big John Gordon fan, and I've read his work as well, and nobody achieves success alone, is what he says. Yeah. And I truly believe that in every sense for every student, but uniquely in the L experience. As an L teacher, 75% of our time, our students aren't with us. They're mm -hmm. not in that mm -hmm. classroom setting. So their experiences, yeah. especially for newcomers, are going to be with your school leaders, your teaching assistants, your support teachers, their content teachers, the cafeteria team, the bus team, the maintenance team, you know, all of those members. So I'm a big believer that everybody in the building needs to know who your L students are mm -hmm. and what supports they're going to need to be successful throughout the day. And so yeah, that all hands on deck approach is a story that I tell through that chapter. So um, you've also written, um, a chapter is it, or is it just a um, a little bit in uh, Chip Baker's The Impact of Influence, Volume Three? So, is that a chapter? Is it like a how many co-authors are part of that book? Yes. Yeah, so there are twenty uh, co-authors okay. uh, part of this book. It's all all women from mm -hmm. across the country as well, and it's a really a great opportunity to be a part of. It's a, a much different topic. It's a very personal book where okay. every Every woman in the book has written about trials and tribulations that she has overcome and that people and influencers along the way who helped her become the person that she is today. And so it's a very vulnerable book. Um, it's a game changer in terms of, you know, readers from all over the country are connecting with all the women and the different experiences that we've had. And it's really helping women see that they can overcome their tribulations as well. And so I'm proud of that, that work and be a part of that. Is that for any uh, women or is it kind of geared towards educators? No, that's very much not geared towards educators, I would say. I mean, educators obviously would benefit from it, but any woman, any okay. woman would benefit from reading those stories. Okay. So talk me a little bit through the process of writing Take Me Home because, you know, you said it started as a uh, poem and then you had to turn it into a book uh, during the six month period you had. So how was that while you're teaching full time and never having been an author of more than a chapter of a short those these compilations? How did that how did that work to to read a whole, write a whole book? Yes. So when I was given that opportunity, you know, to take that time and write that book, it was a lot of of nights and mm -hmm. a lot of early mornings and continuing to teach. But I started off really with a lot of interviews, and it was kind of pre pandemic through the pandemic. So at first, okay. I still have, I have a report all the young people who are in the book or you know it's a true story they're out there working and living with their families today so it was reaching out to uh, many of the students that I'd worked with over the years to see you know here's my goal here's my mission here's what I want us you know to be able to do to help the world what do you think about that mm -hmm. and from and you know the, I call them kids but they're like in their 30s now um, but they had responded you know and said yeah Miss B like I'm in I want to talk about mm -hmm. my experience mm -hmm. Here in the US. So it was a lot of FaceTimes and follow up questions. Um, in the beginning, before the pandemic, we would meet at local coffee shops. And I have notebooks here of just notes and notes and notes. Okay. And as they're talking, I'm just writing and writing and writing. Yeah, and, yeah, writing. Yeah. and then I would go back and look at it later and reread all those notes and say, what can I pull out of this that they said that I think would be valuable for people to hear? And okay. so, and then I would go back and send them, you know, what I had written as, because I had to be them, you know, as their eyes. And I thought it's important for people to hear it as that young person. And so then I would send that chapter back to them and say, is there anything you could clarify here? Is there any questions you have? I have follow-up questions. I want to add a detail about this. I want to add, make sure I'm accurate about a piece of the culture. I want to make sure I'm accurate about where you were at that time. And mm -hmm. just including those details to paint an accurate picture. And so from all those follow-ups and conversations and post um, meetings and FaceTimes and notes, I started to develop each chapter. And then from that, uh, we started to think well, even bigger, well, what else could we do to help people understand what it was really like where you came from? Mm -hmm. So uh, we put a map at the beginning okay. of each chapter and we put two pinpoints to show where they were and how far they were away from the US. 
And sometimes we tried to cover every experience. So sometimes they weren't, they were in the US already. Sometimes they were far away. Sometimes many of them were in the same country and had not met yet until they had come here. So we tried to kind of paint that picture of look at the visual of where they were. The other thing we started to learn from the experience was we wanted to include the book in Spanish as well within the same book. So we had it translated and we have it in English and then it repeats in Spanish. And we wanted to give people an idea of what it might be like to look at a different language and try to comprehend it without any support. And so we worked through that part of the process. And then with the publisher, we worked through ideas of what we wanted the cover to look like. And so it became really important to include you know, facets and details of all of the different young people in the book. And this is the city and where they were headed. Um, so it was, it was a really about a two year process when you look at the grand scale of it and working through all those pieces and then going through the editing. Yeah, that sounds like an endeavor and just a meeting with those students. Uh, had you had much contact with them in that period of time between being their teacher? Uh, some of them, yes. You know, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, once they, I always say, once you're my kid, you're always my kid, right? Yeah. So, you know, once they left high school, you know, I had attended some of their college graduations. They had okay. asked me to come watch them graduate, or they would reach out to me when they still help navigating, you know, when they started to get married and have children of their own. And now it's time to enroll their kids back in school. And hey, Miss B, I have a five-year-old daughter now. Oh my God, I'm going to teach her that long, you know, and she's ready to come to kindergarten. What paperwork do you need, you know, or hey, I need to find someone now that I'm in the music field. Do you know anybody out in the world who could teach me X? You know, it's mm -hmm. so, you know, I always had that connection piece. Uh, with many of them, and I still do today. They're really proud of this work. They're excited to be a part of it. Um, and it, it was just became, uh, it's always natural for me to want to help them, you know? And so they always felt comfortable and their parents too, you know, it would uh -huh. help with navigating the community resources, the job resources. Hey, I want to learn more English. Where do I go? You know, yeah. hey, I have a question. Who just came to you? Do you know an attorney I could call? You know, just all these different random sure. questions we navigate. Yeah, and that's great, like seeing that impact that you've had as a teacher years later, right, that sure. you're having these communications and seeing them have kids and, you know, now they're part of this book as well. So that is uh, such an experience for them. So uh, this book has already been published, correct? It's coming out yeah. in, so in July. It was released July of last year. Yeah. Okay, July of last year. So people can find that on Amazon or wherever they want to buy books. So, <laughs> okay, great, great. Yeah. So um, I wanted to talk also about some of your um, speaking. You have a breakout session at the Teach Better Conference in October. Uh, so talk about your session um, and uh, what people can learn from it. And then some of the other conferences that you are going to speak at in late summer, early fall. Sure. So I'm actually headed to Orlando on this Friday. And okay. I'm part of the Model Schools Conference, the ICLE uh, in Disney. And that'll okay. be uh, the first time I'm presenting in a national conference other than out of state. And okay. so our, our conference title um, is called Take Me Home, Unmasking the Fear of Communicating with Elf Families, or we've called it Take Me Home, Strengthening Connections with Elf Families and Learning Communication Tools. So we've kind of straddled between those two topics, but um, it is a presentation that does a few things. Um, it talks about, first, it shares a little bit of our true story that I shared with you today. And then from there, it moves into some pieces of a documentary that the young people in this book have created themselves from their perspective. So we weave some of the documentary through it to help people kind of shift their lens and get a feel for what this student thoughts are on being an L student in school. Then we drive into what I call practical use tomorrow tools. I'm all about those. And it's about, you know, what are the 10 essential questions you should ask when you receive an L student? You know, they're all different. And that's kind of our premise is two things. One is lack of language never equals lack of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And number two is when you meet someone learning English for the first time, please treat that time in their life like an asset and not a deficit. And here's all the questions you should ask in order to achieve that. And so we go through these 10 essential questions of what you should ask when you receive an L student. And not only that, we broaden it to, here are the essential questions your entire team should be considering within the building for them sure. to be successful outside of the L classroom. Then we dive into how do we connect our kids because they feel really isolated when they first um, come to a new school, whether they're born here or not. So here are ways that we connect our kids within the school in different languages. Here's how we connect them within the district and here's how we connect them within the community. So we lo look at all the different ways and model how to do that. 
Okay. From there, we start to talk about real tools that teachers can use to communicate with parents. So mm -hmm. tools that they're not familiar with, uh, technology tools, phone-based tools, written tools. Um, I've got about eight different resources that I share and model for teachers to learn. Here are ways you can call them in five minutes, you know, mm -hmm. and have live translators on the phone. Here are messages you can use that will go directly to the parent's phone and they can communicate back to you in the language they prefer. And we talk a lot about that, that idea of, what is the language the parents prefer? Not, oh, why aren't they learning English? You know, so we dive into that a little bit. And then we end with an immersion experience. So here's what it feels like to be an EL student. And we're going to give you an immersive experience so you can gauge what that might feel like. Um, and then we end with a thank you. You know, we celebrate a lot of the things the educators are already doing. And um, the kids have a special thank you for them as an ending. Yeah, and I really like that immersion um, experience, even for a short breakout session. And um, so are you using a language for that experience that maybe a lot of people don't know, and then they're kind of immersed, right? Kind of we are. how that would look uh, for your session. So um, I actually just finished working up with it with a few of the students from the book. They actually okay. created it. And so we use the languages uh, of Gujarati, which is from okay. India, and we use French. So we're using those two languages and we um, give an experience to teachers and directions on how to do something in those languages with no visual support at first. So it's just a student talking to the teachers, telling them what to do and the teachers are standing there holding their materials and often we get a lot of deer in headlight looks, yeah. which is what we're kind of experiencing and expecting. And from that, then we review the video again with the teacher still with the students still speaking Gujarati, um, or French and using the visuals as they say each step. And that really shows teachers the difference between just talking versus show me, you know? And so teachers start to kind of experience that and understand the importance behind it when they're communicating with an L student themselves. Yeah, you know, I really like how, um, you know, people use those when they're giving sessions, whether it be on a topic like you have or uh, just for trainings for uh, people who want to become language teachers, you know, that's a good experience uh, to kind of realize how it is to be that language learner that doesn't know the language, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. you know, I, I will definitely link to the Teach Better conference. Um, and then if you are speaking at other conferences, late summer, early fall, if I, you know, I could put yeah. that in the show notes as well for when this comes. Um, so tell me about your current work. Um, you're teaching ELs uh, right now. Um, that you know earlier on you taught a little bit of English at the college level, but uh, how do you inform teachers of other subjects to understand um, better how be how being immersed in a new language is different and um, some of the community impact that you've had uh, through your school? Tell me a little bit about that. So you know, as I said before, you know we are we need our team. You, you know, nobody yeah. to achieve success alone. So the one of some of the things that I do immediately when I receive who our L students are going to be for the school year, um, because it's a very um, fast moving population. So you know, sometimes you have seen kids for years. Sometimes they come mid year because that's when their visa was given to them. Sometimes they move in from a new district. So you know, we're always flexible. We're always changing. But one of the first things I do with my teachers is meet with them on a Zoom or in person if they're down the hall after school and say, hey, you know, so um, I, I'm trying to think of an example. So, hey, Katarina's coming in, you know, next week. I need you to know about her formal education or her informal education. What was her education experience like where she's coming from? What was she strong in in her academic setting? What languages does she speak at home? Can she read and write in her first language? That's a really important piece. Don't make the assumption that a student can read and write in their first language while they're learning English without checking that out. Yeah. And so maybe because if they can read and write in their first language, now they've got a root to pull from. You know, now it's just a matter of let me learn the language differences between my first language and English. If yeah. they're not formally educated, they don't have any roots to pull from. Now I'm starting by teaching them how to read. And I have yeah. students who have both experiences, but it's really important for the classroom teacher to know that because yeah, you don't want to you don't want to throw something um, in um, Kinyarwandan at them and maybe they can't read or write in it. You know, maybe mm -hmm. they just listen to it and speak it at home with mom and dad. You know, so or if it's a student that was born here and is educated, but you might have some English literacy needs. So it just depends. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. We also want to let them know the results of our own screener or that information that's coming from their school in terms of their English language proficiency, which ranges from levels one to six. 
And so, and it can be different in reading, writing, listening, and speaking. I have students who are really strong at reading and writing, but need a lot of support to listening and speaking English. Yeah. So it just depends. So kind of starting to paint that movie, I say, you know, of that student. Then it's into, okay, now that you know what their levels are, where they're coming from, what their education looks like, what were the differences in their school system? Whether yeah. it's, you know, a school that's an hour away from here or it's a school that's in a different country. What were the expectations? What was the timing? What's their family life like? You know, are mom and dad working? Are mom, what language do mom and dad prefer to communicate in? And here are the tools you need to use to immediately contact them and introduce yourself. Then we would dive more into what are the adaptations in the classroom the student's going to need while they're still acquiring the language based on their proficiency level. And how can I support you and we can work together to do that. And so remember that this is not an end all be all, it's very fluid. So even though they're at a level two right now, as the year goes on and they grow their skills, those adaptations are going to start to fan away. You know, so just kind of continuing that conversation, not like a one and done talk, see you, good luck. But, yeah, you know, yeah. we're a team and we're going to continue to work as a team all year long to help our student achieve success. And um, you've also been uh, very impactful in the community, maybe connecting families uh, with resources. So what's something that you work uh, with families a lot in doing nowadays? Like, you know, uh, maybe if it's healthcare. Um, you know, food so, banks, who drives those type of things. Yes, I mean, all of the above, you know, what you just mm -hmm. mentioned. So we connect our students to um, Fiala Countywide summer camps. So okay. they can meet other kids from other districts where they get to get together with other bilingual students and, you know, get to make those connections. Um, we connect our parents through parent nights. We just did, a, right before the end of the school year, we did an ice cream and family game night. So we've had yeah. an ice cream truck come. And we had family games from around the world and the families came and everything was free and they got to meet other parents, you know? Okay. So it was wonderful to walk around and see and hear Mandarin and hear Russian and hear Spanish and hear French and hear um, Gujarati and, you know, and, and to hear all these different parents speaking and connecting, you know, with other parents that they didn't know lived a block away, you know? And so just giving them that opportunity. Um, we connect them with the local intermediate unit. And we connect them with the local um, job workforce boards because sometimes people coming in aren't sure where to work, you know, and so or aren't sure what opportunities are there. We connect them with free adult English classes through the intermediate unit and their EL department so that they have Zoom opportunities and university level opportunities to grow their English skills if they want to. Um, and because in our district in particular, our kids surpass their parents pretty quickly in terms of English proficiency, right? Because they're at school getting their free education while mom and dad are at work, and if their workplace doesn't offer that opportunity, then yeah. we, want, we want their kids to be on an equal level playing field with them so that they don't have to be the leaders all the time. And so we work with the community resources to give them that opportunity as well. Um, we, learn, we have local food banks and local okay. medical places who offer things in a variety of languages with interpreters. So it's all about connecting our parents to all the resources they need and creating a school environment where they feel comfortable in asking us you know, for yeah. that help. Um, I do like uh, with my parents, I'll do instead of like a weekly email written form, I'll do a weekly Zoom where I just record myself talking like I'm talking to you and letting them know about resources like this or what's happening in school this week and the parents will just watch my video, you know? And so, and the kids like to see it too. And then when they come back to school, they're like, oh, my mom saw you on TV yesterday on their <laughs> video. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, just re reaching out, extending that hand constantly. Uh, so parents know that you're there. Yeah, yeah. No, I think all those things that you mentioned are great for people who, you know, need to learn more English, but don't know where to look, right? Uh, they're too shy to ask about it. Um, but also when you're talking about just connecting families with people from their country or people that speak their language, they might not realize live pretty close to them, right? So that's always a, an eye opener for them. So uh, out of everything we talked about, your book, uh, your uh, work with families, uh, your professional speaking, What's one thing you'd like listeners to remember? You know, I'd really just like them to remember that when you meet people learning English for the first time, please treat that time in their life like an asset and not a handicap or not a deficit because they're really relying on you to help them feel less like a rotten apple. Because when you're put into a situation where your language is so limited, you really start to feel that way sometimes. 
And if we don't give them the tools that they need, these students the tools that they need to read, write, listen, and speak, and speak you know, fluently in this new language, then I feel like we're really masking them for life. You know, we're their, free, we're their free ticket to these communication skills that they're going to need. And I'm just happy to be a part of the, you know, the group that gets to do that. Great, great. Well, thank you so much for being on the Out of the Trenches podcast. Where can people connect with you and find you online? Yes. So people can find me in various places. I'm on all social media outlets, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and uh, LinkedIn. It's at Andrea Bittner Books. And we also have a new website we just launched, andreabittnerbooks.com. And that's where you can learn more about our story. We were featured on the local news this week. There's a short clip of that. Um, and uh, reach me if you'd like me to come out and meet your teachers. I'd love the opportunity to support you. Great, great. Well, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you on. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too.